Peace, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm still waiting on Brother Obi to come in. He should be in in a few minutes. Um, but essentially, today we're going to be talking about Africa and Cuba relations in light of a long legacy, obviously, of African people and the Cubans who have connected on the similar interest of being anti-imperialist. Um, it's a legacy that's historical and it's one that's also very relevant today. So that's what we're going to talk about. I figured while I waited for Brother Obi, I can just go in and we could just start having a conversation. I've seen some comments that were interesting and I'm sure he'll like to um, address them once he comes in. Um, but 313 Dream, and you said, um, and I'm assuming because I used an image for this broadcast of Fidel Castro with um, Nelson Mandela, Fidel Castro, I believe Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah, and I believe there's one also with Thomas Sankara. He said, that was Cuba then. Cuba now treats black people like ish. There was no black and brown coalition. Uh, why can't we let it go, Sigh. Um My thoughts on that preliminarily are that um, the Cuba, it, when you're thinking of Cuba as a country that's basically not divorced of African people, that's not true to the legacy. Um, if you know anything about Cuba, you know that there is a significant African population there. And there are certainly instances of racism there, as there are race, instances of racism inside of every single society. Um, one thing that I think we have to keep in mind, though, having instances of racism because people have been conditioned into that mindset versus having a systemic effort to oppress African people. Those are two very different things. We can deal with individual racists. I personally have no problem dealing with the individual racists. As Kwame Torre said, he said that um, it, the problem isn't that someone wants to lynch you. The problem is that someone has the power to lynch you. Now, if we're dealing with a power situation, that's a serious threat that we have to face on all fronts. Individual racists will probably always exist because individual racists are people typically who have their own issues, their own insecurities. And so let's not allow certain people to uh, give us a, the narrative that the country of Cuba, which has very much been outwardly um, against institutional racism should be equated to a country like the United States or a country like a European country. Um, it's a country with a very, very rich history of African uh, solidarity. So I think we should keep in mind it with it as such. Um, let's see some more comments. Um, black coach said, black and brown is just another trick word that's used to deceive, the, deceive us. Latinos are a new race invented to get us eliminated by being discounted and by having our dem demographic segmented, uh, divide and defeat. I, th I think, you know, um, we can keep in mind that you know, colonialism obviously has divided our people. And there are different identities that a lot of us might, might adopt because of the fact that we've been so divided. Um, those identities to me personally are not a threat in themselves. Those identities only become a threat when those become more important than our, our centralizing um, identity as African people. So when you have someone who identifies as Afro-Latino you know, that's not a threat in itself to me, but if that person has no dealings or refuses to identify themselves as African, then that's where we're talking. Can you guys hear me? It's like my browser went out as far as my mic. I can get a comment saying I can still hear you. I'll know that you guys hear me. Okay, you still can't hear me? Okay, now, okay, thanks guys. Uh, so let's keep this conversation going. Um, don't forget Asada Shakur, she's still being protected by the Cuban government. Don't think that that is not something that's insignificant. She is like on the most, terrorist list for the United States. That means they want her blood. That is not significant, insignificant. The fact that this small country that I'm sure, you know, it's not like Cuba has not tried to mend its relationship with America. The problem is every time that Cuba has tried to, um, the United States has done something that they just outwardly disagree with. 
Um, so it's it, there's been a lot of opportunities where Cuba could have taken the, the positions that other African governments or other Latino governments or other European governments, any other government um, would take. Um, um, that is one that uh, prioritizes. Uh, you guys still can't hear me? I see James said he can't hear me. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go back out and then I'm gonna come back in. Hopefully I can figure this out. All right, y'all, I'm back. Can you hear me now? I don't see anyone saying they can't hear me, so I'm gonna take it that you can. Let's see. I'm gonna bring Brother Obi in now. Hopefully, he can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Can hear me? Okay. Most definitely. <laughs> hear I don't know what's. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. For some reason, like my mic just goes out sometimes. But yeah. Yeah. All type of stuff <laughs> happens like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. So it looks like we're good with the technical difficulties. Um, everyone, if you if you do not know, this is Brother Ubi Egbuna Jr. He's been on his channel before, but just in case you all might have missed that broadcast, Brother Obi, if you could please introduce yourself very briefly. Sure. Um, my name is Obi Egbuna Jr. I'm an organizer. I'm a journalist. I'm a teacher. I'm a children's playwright. And today um, I have the honor of representing the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association in my capacity as their external relations officer. Brother Obi, we were having a pretty uh, interesting conversation before you came in. So someone made the comment, and I'm sure we're gonna get into this with the Cuba talk, um, that, you know, the, so I use the image of uh, Fidel Castro with Kwame Kruma, you know, and uh, Nelson Mandela, you know, as the screenshot for this broadcast, someone said, that was Cuba back then. Cuba now treats black people like ish. There is no black and brown coalition. Why can't we let it go? Sigh. Um, I was given my thoughts on that, but I know you um, will probably put that <laughs> that idea to rest very quickly. So if you <laughs> want to on that before we even get into the topic, because I think it's very fitting. A lot of people don't even want to talk about uh, Cuba because they see it as being um, something that's against you know African liberation. So I think that would be a good introductory question um all, the only thing i'd say about that well first of all pleasure to be on they should have been with us two weeks ago and they would have saw all those african artists all those spanish-speaking africans performing uh merengue performing jazz performing classical music performing um classical jazz performing um steel band music performing hip-hop 
And then you have to ask yourself, and that's today, those artists were today. That wasn't Machito in the 1940s that Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker hooked up with. That wasn't um, Chucho Valdez, who we call the Duke Ellington of Cuba. That wasn't the Nicholas Guillen, the first poet laureate of the revolution, who they called the Langston Hughes of Cuba because he was African too. So these were artists right this moment, right this second of African ancestry that have been empowered by that revolution to use art as a weapon against our former colonizers and captors. So when we do showings of that, they can get a chance to see it. And um, maybe I'm still in teacher mode right now because my children had science yesterday. So whoever said that to you, tell, ask them who's the face of the astronaut program, the space program in Cuba. The name is Arnaldo Mendez. He's the first African in the Western Hemisphere to ever go to space. He went to space in 1980 with the Soviet Union, but he's the face of their space program. And now he's preparing other African children because they saw him in Cuba, Spanish speaking Africans to go into another orbit to make a contribution. Today, when you look at their doctors, who we're gonna talk about today, there are many images of those doctors and those doctors look like, um, when you see those doctors, you know that they're African, undeniably African. So people who say that, they're just saying that because they're creative with their excuses. It gives them an excuse not to defend Cuba. It gives them an excuse not to fight for the blockade. It gives them an excuse not to demand that our sister Sada Shakur is taking off the FBI's terrorist list. It gives them an excuse not to fight for the blockade. It gives them an excuse not to send any children to the Latin American School of Medical Sciences so they could come back into their community and be the best. Today, they have 4,000 doctors dispersed throughout the African continent. That's what we're here to talk about today. Today, they have that going on. Not, not 50 years ago, not 60 years ago. They're in Liberia today. They're in Zimbabwe today. They're in Ghana today. They're in Burkina Faso today. So whoever, but what it is, is you have a lot of high profile people who never really understood the Cuban question. And um, they, it's a man named Carlos Moore who wrote the book, Castro, the Blacks in Africa, who started all this trouble. But if whoever reads the introduction of that book, he begins the book by thanking Ambassador Andrew Young for walking him by the hand to the Ford Foundation to write that book. And then he came out with another book about 12, 13 years ago called Pichon. Then he put together a statement talking about racism. And what he did is he got some people who were high profile, who used to be on the revolutionary track, who are not anymore. So he had Kathleen Cleaver, the um, former Black Panther, the former secretary of SNCC, back when she was Kathleen Neal. She signed on to it. Dr. Malefi Asante at Temple University, who's considered the founding father of Afrocentricity, he signed it too, till we gave him a call and he took his name off of it. Um, the late Conrad Worrell, signed his name, but at the end of his life, he was trying to get to Cuba to get cured of the COVID that took his life. Um, Randy Weston, the jazz pianist, signed on to it. Cornell West signed on to it. Um, oh man, the, the, the list, Susan Taylor from Essence Magazine signed on to it. All these different people signed on to it, but most of them who do it, or most of them who share that position, they don't wanna come on a public forum like this and discuss it. The last time I was on, I told you, um, WRFG in Atlanta, um, Your World News, tried to get Umar Johnson and I shoulder to shoulder to discuss it because that's his position too. He didn't want any parts. Renoko Rashidi runs around saying that. You can't get him to have a conversation with us shoulder to shoulder about it. And it won't even be a debate. It'll just be an objective, scientific conversation. And um, none of these people who go around propagating that, but it comes from Carlos Moore. So if you stand with Carlos Moore, you stand with the Ford Foundation, you stand with the National Endowment for Democracy. To close this out, there no one's saying that racism doesn't exist there, but the question is, what is the root cause of it? And we challenge people who propagate that notion to identify any other country in the Western Hemisphere where our ancestors were captured and dropped off that has done more to eradicate racism than Cuba. And you won't find it. And um, so what we're saying is you look at their music, you look at their art, you look at their space program, you look at their diplomatic corps, you look at every layer of society, Africans are well represented. And the African identity has never been suppressed in Cuba because the first all African 
political party in the Western Hemisphere was created in 1908. We can go back beyond 1959. And the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey had 40 branches there. But if you want to talk about up to date, then they need to watch our next show and they'll see all these Africans um, showing you art on a whole nother level, answering the question that Paul Robeson asked 60 years ago, is the artist gonna elect to fight for freedom or slavery or captivity as we like to say today? So it's, it's, it's rhetoric, it's baseless. And the people who propagate that, they're like drive-by shooters. They don't want, you know, they wanna drive by and run. They're cowards. They don't wanna deal with that. Um, they don't even wanna defend their argument. Okay, so there you there you all go. I mean, I told y'all he was gonna did that argument right there. So that's the perfect one, I think, to introduce. So the whole campaign. Um, mm -hmm. So get out of Cuba's way is the name of the campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, if you could just explain for those who might be confused about that particular title, why did you pick that title for this? Well, um, I'll tell you what, how about this? Because, you know, um, one of the reasons that uh, we love this show, we feel that this is an organizer's platform. So let's just go back through um, all the work we've done on Cuba. Can we do that? And then we'll just bring it up. Yeah, let's do that. So, so let's take you back to 1995, um, right when we were working on the Million Man March and the Day of Absence and Day of Action campaign. And we were introduced to an African in the diplomatic corps named Jose Ponce Caravello who was now one of the key press people in Cuba. And um, he was the first secretary of the Cuban intersection at that time. At that time, he was the highest ranking Cuban diplomat to be deported from the United States. So they deported him just to make a point. And um, so we met him and we started working with them. So in 1997, we sent a high school um, student of when we were in an organization at the time called the Pan-African Student Youth Movement, Cuba organized, um, an international youth festival there. So we sent a high school student to represent us there. Three years later, we defied the travel ban again, and it was their turn to host the organization of Caribbean and Latin American youth. And we went to defy the blockade. And we were detained at Charlotte International Airport and myself and another comrade named Devin Walker, we were facing one year in prison and a $50,000 fine. And the Center for Constitutional Rights wrote a letter on our behalf and that was over. Um, four years after that, um, I was a dorm director at Bowie State University and um, the students walked out on April 4th, 2003. And it was students at Bowie State, Morgan State University down the street, Coppin University and the now um, defunct Sojourner Douglas. And they did this simultaneously at the same time. And a Baltimore police officer, a retired narco police officer who took over the public safety division, he took the flyer and he sent it to Homeland Security, said that, said that he, this was a security threat. And then the next thing you know, I was under FBI investigation. And when my lawyer called the FBI, we came to find out that the, what they were watching me because they said when, I, when someone frequents the Cuban intersection as much as I do, it's just routine. And what were we doing? We were taking the National Conference of Black Lawyers, which you now belong to. We, we were taking them there for meetings. We were taking professors from Bowie State there for meetings. We were taking journalists from the Washington Afro-American newspaper there. We were taking um, Dr. Lee Muhammad. He was the Health and Human Services Director of the Nation of Islam at the time. That's all we were doing. But we said then, and we maintain the position now, if the disciples of J. Edgar Hoover want to pull the plug on us, we couldn't think of a better reason for them to do it than standing with the Cubans, standing with them like they stood with us in Angola, standing with them like they stood with us in Guinea-Bissau, standing with them like they stood with us in Mozambique, standing like um, them like they were willing to stand with us in the Congo after Patrice Lumumba was assassinated by the CIA, but it was the Congolese that didn't want to fight. So on that level, if we were going to end up like Malcolm, if we were going to end up like Martin, if we were going to end up like Medgar Evers, what better way to go than to stand with the Cuban revolution and the Cuban people? And then a year after that, like right around that time, D.C. General, the public hospital in the District of Columbia, was shutting down. And for a long time, for a couple of years there, it, it's the southeast section of D.C., the poorest part of D.C., the most economically challenged part of D.C., and they didn't have a level one trauma center. They didn't have a prenatal care unit. So we, the Cubans said that if we could work it out, they would come there and they would um, take over the hospital to keep it up and running. They would be willing to do that. 
And this was be and this was two years after they were willing to send medical personnel to um, New York City after 9/11. And then a, and then of course a couple of years after that you had Hurricane Katrina. And after Hurricane Katrina, they were willing to send a 1,500 member environmental disaster task force to the Gulf region of this country. And if you know anything about the Gulf region of this country, you know that those were the two worst public hospitals in the United States of America. And they said they would be there until those hospitals were up to par. So we were working to do that. Oh, and when we were um, organizing around DC General, we got a hunt for those of you who think that um, the churches are a waste of time, we got 150 preachers to come and do a praying. You heard of sit-ins, you've heard of um, sit-downs, you've heard of all types of protests, but 150 preachers on a Sunday after church came and held hands and prayed. And one of the things we they prayed for is that Cuban medical personnel could come and take over DC General Hospital. We've been at this a long time. And then after that, um, we did three albums with M1 from Dead Prez. Um, shout out to M1 from Dead Prez, the internationally acclaimed hip hop group. The name of the project is called Battle Cuba Zim, word, wordpress.com. It's not for sale. You can get it and you can listen to the music. It's over a hundred songs of music. Every genre of music you could think of is cross-generational. The One of the last poets is on it. Native Son is on it. One of the original lead sing the original lead singer of the moments for you R and B um, fans, old school R and B fans, as you like to say, it's all type of music on there. And the reason we did that is because when I first met M1, we were in front of um, the city council in Brooklyn, saying in 2005 with one of the most courageous city councilmen we've ever had, Councilman Charles Barron, and we had a press conference that was organized by our brother Omawali Adewale and the uh, grassroots artist movement saying that Cuban medical personnel should be able to come to New York City because New York's healthcare system was in crisis. And this was before Hurricane Katrina. And so um, we wrote the first children's play about the Cuban doctors called Cuba's Greatest Army through the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company. And we're on the verge of having the first children to children's exchange with La Colmenita, which is the National Theatrical Ensemble in Cuba for children. So because we did that play and we did it during the international um, solidarity with the Cuban Five, who were the five Cuban um, freedom fighters who came here just to bring attention to terrorist organizations like Alpha 66 in Miami, just to bring attention to terrorist organizations like Brothers to the Rescue, who were part of the network that is makes up what is called the Cuban American National Foundation, which was created in 1983 and given full support by the Reagan administration, whose slogan is from proletarians to profiteerians. And I'm gonna tell you something, many of the t attacks on Cuba don't come because of the, uh, the racial dynamics, because they've always been there and they know that they've done everything to eradicate those and continue to do so. The real reason is because many in our community who say that they're for, for justice, maybe that is all they're for, because in this country, unfortunately, the ceiling is justice and not power. We'll deal with that too today, but um, they they don't want to identify with a socialist government, and we don't blame them because all some people are willing to do is just use um the struggle against racism to see they if they can climb any ladders in capitalism because they think the Fortune 500 companies got some crumbs waiting for them or going to throw them a half of a bone, a bone of a bone of a bone. So they still believe in this country. They still believe in this system. And many of them are closet patriots. And uh, deep down, they're just like Francis Scott Key. Deep down, they're just like Susan B. Anthony. Deep down, they're just like the founding fathers. Oh, I'm sorry, the first thieves. They really have that type of patriotism. Deep down, they're Colin Powell. Deep down, they're the Buffalo Soldiers. Deep down, they're the Tuskegee Airmen. Deep down, they're Peter Salem and Crispus Attucks. They're not fooling us a bit. And anytime, and maybe they embrace Jackie Robinson because when Comandante Fidel Castro and the Cuban delegation came to Harlem for the first time since the tyranny, when our people welcomed them like heroes and Brother Malcolm went to pay his respects. Osage for Kwame and Krumah met with them that week, that during that time period. Gamal Abdonessa met with them um, doing a bad impersonation of James Meredith by his lonesome was old Jackie Robinson saying that the Cubans weren't welcome in Harlem. 
the same way he was by his lonesome when he attacked Muhammad Ali for refusing to go to Vietnam, the same way he was by his lonesome when he attacked Paul Robeson before the House of Un-American Activities Committee for saying he didn't feel patriotically obligated to go to war with the Soviet Union um, and what have you. So maybe they're maybe they're fans of Jackie Robinson. Maybe when they're making these statements, they've got on their Brooklyn Dodgers jersey right now, number 42. And so you, you you never know what people's motivation are, but you plan with you're playing with fire right now. And if you don't have the context, if you don't have the, the perspective, don't regurgitate rhetoric from people and you don't know the origins of the arguments you're making just because you want to be controversial. You're making a fool of yourself. You know, I seen this super it was very idiotic. I don't know if you came across it. There was a documentary on YouTube, um, basically why why socialism does not work in Africa or something like that. And the dude, when I looked him up, like I'm not surprised it was him because he has like a reputation as being one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's they people will look at a socialist country and see the struggles that are going on and say, "Aha, this is why socialism doesn't work." And completely ignore the role of America, the role of the of the European Union, like of the role of the United Nations. So it's just so backwards that um, you know we kind of like just I think because we don't look for information, we we'll just believe something just on face value. But it's but it's more. Um, Kwame Ture used to tell us this all the time when we were babies and struggled. People judge socialism by capitalist standards. They're looking for how many Jay-Z's they have, how many 50 cents they have, how many corporate lap dogs they have. That's not the order of the day. That's not the order of the day. And let us just say that due to the stigma, Sister Tony, associated with that word. So let's just remove the word. Let's say, because some of the people in our community say, well, we shouldn't even be uh, using that language. But we're talking in English. If I said it in Shona, I'd have to translate it. If I said it in Igbo, I'd have to translate it. If I said it in Swahili, I'd have to translate it. So number one. And then um, I remember I had, we had to um, deal with um, someone very respected in our community and we respect him too. As a matter of fact, he's a signator of the Get Out of Cuba Way Appeal. His name is Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Y'all know him very well, but we respect the old man. And um, But he was talking about Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and he was calling him a Marxist. And the reason was because if you read the autobiography of Nkrumah, at that point in his development, he says, I'm a Christian and a Marxist, and he doesn't see a contradiction. Now, look at that right there. That's a cultural statement in itself, because Marx says religion is the opium of the opium of the masses. So he, he, he wouldn't say that a Christian could be Marxist. He wouldn't say that a Muslim could be Marxist. He wouldn't say that a Jew could be Marxist or a Buddhist could be Marxist or a Confucianist could be Marxist. He would not say that at all, because that would contradict the cultural template that he used. But even at that point, Nkrumah was saying that there was a parallel, because while he was looking at Marx, while he was looking at Engels, while he was looking at Lenin, while he was looking at Stalin, while he was looking at Cornforth, while he was looking at Montesquieu, he was also looking at um, Alexander, Bishop Alexander Walters or Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or um, Benjamin Mays or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because anyone that deals with liberation theology and the social gospel, you tackle the question of wealth and you come to the conclusion that the wealth of the world must be shared. Even the Christians tell you that Jesus fell, um, fed a village on a whole loaf of bread. So forget and and the thing we had to let Dr. Jeffries know, Nkrumah reading Marx, or Sekou Toure reading Marx, or Mangalizo Sabukwe reading Marx, or Emilcar Cabral reading Marx, ain't no different than Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall and you yourself reading Hamilton or Jefferson just to use law as a weapon for resistance of our people. So people have to be logical and not emotional and make sense of what they're hearing and make sense of what they're saying. And at a time in this country, at a time in this historical moment where there are 2,063 billionaires worth $9 trillion and 400 million people on the African continent living on $1.90 a day, which means they can, if they went to the laundry mat, they could put their clothes in the washer, but they couldn't dry them. It means they could get on the subways and jump on, but not get off. They'd have to jump over the rail and risk having the terrorist police gun them down. So this is the moment that we live in. And at the 
same time, we'll go even further with this before we get back to what we're here for. It also deals with the fact that, and Nkrumah's the one that pointed it out in the book when he separated himself from Marx, the book called Consciencism, Philosophy for De Decolonization in 1964. He said, where Marx puts the emphasis on economic determining forces, we say political ideology, seek ye first the political kingdom. And that's very important because we say that the human resource is the most precious resource. And that's coming from the people who are products of the richest continent in the world, but we're the poorest people. So we look at that differently anyway. So um, when, when people, and this is very important, and then he goes to tell you that socialism finds its ancestral roots in communalism. So we were communists before Marx's great grandmother and great grandfather ha had their first kiss, held hands for the first time. We have the pattern on that. So, and then he said that capitalism finds its ancestral roots in communalism. I mean, in capitalism, feudalism and capitalism, they go together. That's where you see the ancestral rooting. And that's very important because we know the history of Ebony Magazine, Dr. John Henry Clark, who was a friend of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, he was involved in a project that was financed by Amheiser Bush, and many of you know it well, called Great Kings and Queens of Africa. And what many people did through that is they were introduced to the different dynasties in Africa, the dynasty of Mansa Musa, the dynasty of Menelik. But the reality of the situation is one of the worst aspects of colonialism, one of the worst aspects of imperialism, one of the worst aspects of captivity. We don't say slavery, we say captivity. One of the worst aspects of that is it interrupted a class struggle we were having with each other. That's what the Arabs interrupted. That's what the Europeans interrupted. We, we were telling Mansa Musa, you can't have $400 billion and we're starving. We told the rest of the dynasties that. So we were gonna have to go to war with them before the Europeans and Arabs got involved in the mix. So we were fighting to share the wealth of Africa with every African 20 million years ago. And that's the fight we're having right now, right this second. It hasn't changed a bit. The individuals have changed. The argument has not changed. It's the same argument. And as Nkrumah taught us, and we live by this, and we swear by this, that socialism and African unity are organically complementary. And we're tired of Every time we see a conference where people are paying lip service to Pan-Africanism and quoting Nkrumah like Christians quote Jesus or Muslims quote Muhammad, they skip over that quote right there because they don't want to share the coltan of the Congo with every African. They don't want to share the uranium in Zimbabwe with every African. They don't want to share the oil in Nigeria and oil in Angola with every African. Some of them want to keep it for themselves. Well, you can have those fantasies all you want. We will not be free. We will not be redeemed till every African benefits from the wealth. And the only way we know you can benefit from the wealth is when you're sharing in the wealth. So we want one unified, liberated, socialist Africa. Not a Marxist-Leninist Africa, not a Stalinist Africa, but socialist nevertheless, using our culture and our values and our experience to navigate. Okay, so let's get back to uh, get out of yeah. this way. Um, <laughs> you were, you were kind of drawing out the history, um, but specifically, you know, how does that title uh, make sense? Well, the oh, it, be, because, because the United States government, Democrats and Republicans alike, they, they are responsible for this blockade. The blockade causes um, obstacles, economic obstacles. It causes social obstacles. It causes logistical obstacles, obstacles of all sorts. And the aim of this blockade is to crush the patriotism, to crush the economy, and to crush the social infrastructure. You want to crush the educational system that stands alone. You want to crush the healthcare system that stands alone. You want to crush an agricultural system that stands alone. You want to crush the arts and sports that stand alone. Because, and remember, it goes back to what President Obama said during his first inauguration when he said the might of our military must be matched by the strength of our diplomacy, which means in code, we prefer to bomb you. We prefer to assassinate your leaders. We prefer to leave those leaders drowning in a pool of their own blood to make a statement to anyone who dare walk this path. But if we can't do that because the diplomatic atmosphere does not permit that, we will starve your babies to death. We will starve your women to death. We will starve the men to death. And then after that, 
you will bend your knees and you will beg us to um, work with you. You will beg us to um, give you humanitarian aid. So it's the ultimate challenge to your courage. It's the ultimate challenge to your character. And Cuba has answered the bell again and again and again. And the whole world is on their side to get this blockade lifted. The Vatican is against the blockade. The European Union is against the blockade and all the way on the most extreme side of the spectrum we are, but we understand diplomatic warfare and we understand that the anti-war movement is they put emphasis on traditional and conventional warfare. They love to talk about bombs. They love to talk about warplanes. They long, love to talk about drones. But we're talking about diplomatic terrorism, the type of ter diplomatic terrorism that left 500,000 children dead in Iraq. And Madeleine Albright just came and said, oops, on 60 Minutes. We're talking about what our comrades in Eritrea were subjected to. We're talking about what our people in Zimbabwe, our sisters, our brothers, our, our our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, I've been subjected to in Zimbabwe since 2001, which means that nearly for 50% of their time as an independent nation, the, block, the sanctions were imposed on them in 2001. They got independent in 1980. So the sanctions are 20 years old, but we don't consider it an anniversary. And as a matter of fact, Joe Biden extended them last week. And that should be to no surprise because he's a co original co-sponsor of those sanctions. So Joe Biden is not just a warden on the domestic level, he's a warden on the global front. And so um, Cuba's been subjected to this blockade, but the thing about it is, as they told you during the Ilion Gonzalez situation where they tried to kidnap a seven-year-old boy to score some cheap political points, Comandante Fidel told them that in four months, your average citizen learned more about Cuba than they had in 41 years. And in the last 365 days since the tyranny, the average US citizen has learned more about the Cuban healthcare system than they have in 50 years, than they have in 60 years. Now everybody knows about, they, they've become the face of the corona and um, the fight to eradicate corona, the movement to eradicate corona. And the most embarrassing thing in the world is the country that is obsessed with destroying them is the corona capital of the world. How you, how you like those apples? So we feel that, number one, they should be allowed to come here and save people's lives. That's number one. They should be allowed to come here and train medical personnel who are not qualified or accustomed to dealing with a pandemic. Every doctor, every nurse is not equipped to deal with that. Number three, they should work with the people who are aware of their impeccable track record and support it. That would be the National Medical Association. That would be the Black Nurses Association. And let's get to the good part because we hear these, these conversations about these vaccinations are more adventurous than comic books. But guess what? In the last in the last 11 months, Cuba has created four vaccinations. Two of them come from the Finlay Vaccine Institute. They're the only nation in Latin America to be a vaccine manufacturer. So they have two. One is called Sovereign One. The other one is called Sovereign Two. Sovereign One is for people who have, who have um, caught the pandemic. And Sovereign Two is a preventive measure. But their rate is so low that they can't even do the clinical testing. So it's being done in Iran. But Iran wants the vaccination. Venezuela has said it will be the vaccination for all of Latin America. Um, Bolivia wants it. Nicaragua wants it. So and and before that, the people were make 45 nations had lined up to get interferon alpha 2b, which they created in 1986 for the purpose of dealing with HIV AIDS. So they've got sovereign one. They've got sovereign two. Then their center for biogenetic um, engineering has created um, two more. One is called Mambisa, which is named after the highest ranking Cuba female combatant. Happy Women's Month to all the sisters out there. So there's a vaccination called Mambisa, named after Mambisa who fought to defend Cuba's sovereignty during the Spanish-American War. And then um, they have another one called Abdallah, which is named after Jose Marti Poin. And for the people who were talking earlier to you, tell them that's going on right this second. We're not talking about 1959. We're not talking about 1859. That's happening right now. And Italy, 
the where and we know that Mussolini is rolling over in his grave. We know that Charlie Luciano is rolling over in his grave. We know that um, Frank Costello and Al Capone are rolling over in their grave. 54 Cuban medical personnel in Italy right now treating the sick over there, dealing with this corona pandemic. And all we're saying is that they should be here. And our people, all of our organizations, regardless of where we fall in the spectrum, this is something we should unite around. And on a cultural level, right? Interestingly enough, I'm 51 years old. So I remember being in the ninth grade in 1984 when everybody rushed to see the movie Scarface. And uh, the movie Scarface, let's tell you the history of the movie. Um, the original movie is in 1932, done by the billionaire Howard Hughes. He was infatuated with Al Capone. And Scarface was Al Capone's nickname, for those of you who know your mafia history. So you have to ask yourself, why 52 years later was there a shift from Chicago to Miami? And Al Pacino plays Tony Montana, a Cuban. And in the first dialogue of the movie, he's in immigration talking about on every corner, there are people telling you what to say and what to think. And you have to eat octopus all three times a day. And um, and then, but at the beginning of the movie is Comandante Fidel's speech about the Mario boat lift. And these were the people who were unwilling to, to use his words to adapt to the spirit of the revolution. They missed it when Maya Lansky had his gambling empire there. They missed it when Charlie Luciano had a heroin pipeline that came from Sicily to Havana and the revolution wiped all that out. Th those were the good old days to them. So they decided that they wanted to come to Miami and be with the Cuban American National Foundation and Brothers to the Rescue and Alpha 66 and attempt 90% of the 635 assassination attempts on Comandante Fidel's life. Two years before that, there was a boxing match in Miami between Alexis Arguello and Nicaraguan, who used to support the Sandinista revolution. Then when he started making millions of dollars, he turned on the Sandinista revolution, and then he started rolling with the uh, Miami mafia, as they called them in Cuba. And so they had to fight in the Orange Bowl, and Aaron Pryor beat the hell out of him. So the objective of him becoming um, a four-time, a four-weight champion, it didn't happen. So the because of the relationship between the Sandinistas and the Cubans, the Cubans in Miami tried to turn that into a fiasco. And for those of you who love the Godfather movies, Hyman Roth and Godfather II, fictitiously, that's Maya Lansky. So for all our hip-hop artists who have um, paid old, paid homage to Scarface the movie, or say that the movie changed your life. For every, um, they can be involved in this project. This gives them the opportunity to atone. This gives them the opportunity to make up. We're not judging them. We're not condemning them. Um, our brother who had COVID, ironically, he's recovering. Our brother, Brad Jordan, which y'all know him as Scarface, one of the greatest MCs of all time. He named himself after the movie. And his, and, and his fellow um, hip hop artist, his brother, and Willie D has a podcast saying he's tired of talk. Well, if you're tired of talk, brother, we need to get together and this is some work that we can do together. And this way you can show people that you're not just tired of talk, but you're ready to act. You're ready to serve. You're ready to contribute. You're ready to fight on the front line where you belong. Because anybody who hears you see you got a net, you can see you have a natural warrior spirit, but it's not about just having that warrior spirit. It's about ensuring that it is properly channeled and it is properly directed. So for all the hip hop artists and you name them, Nas, Cormega, Tupac, 50 Cent, all of them who paid homage to Scarface, this is a time to pay homage to Cuba because that the purpose of that movie was to isolate Cuba, demonize Cuba so they could be a regime change in Cuba. So just on a cultural level, these are the things that have happened. This is why we've used the arts to make this statement. So just the fact that in two cultural artistic tributes sister tyranny we've had artists step up from 10 african nations we've had artists participate from eight caribbean nations we've had artists participate from 17 u.s cities we've had artists participate from um four uk countries and including canada 
So, and that's never been done before in the history of Cuban solidarity. So we're building on the work of um, William Worthy. We're building on the work of Lucius Walker. We're building on the work of Malcolm X. We're building on the work of Thomas Sankara. We're building on the work of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who's the first head of state to acknowledge the triumph of the Cuban revolution. We're building on the work of Nelson Mandela. We're building on the work of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yeah, let me say something about that. For the last month, there's been um, a soap opera around the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X. We say that Cuba solidarity work is the bridge. So if you are infatuated with Malcolm and many of the people infatuated with Malcolm, many who lecture on Malcolm, many who write books about Malcolm have never spent a one minute, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds doing any of the work that Malcolm left behind. But since they've done so much research, they know the trail of the service, the trail of the labor, the trail of the work. You can come get some of the work right now and deal with this question of the Get Out of Cuba Way campaign and join hands with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, who were supporters of the Get Out of Cuba Way statement. And since the CIA is an enemy of Cuba, since the Cuba's in it, the FBI, International Terrorist Division is an enemy of Cuba. By dealing with this, not only are we dealing with the blockade, but we're sending the most militant statement at this historical moment. It's letting the FBI and CIA know that the world isn't big enough for the both of us. Either all of us got to go or you have to go. Which one is it going to be? Okay, so I don't want this to be lost, though. So the whole purpose of you pushing this get out of Cuba's way is that you're basically, um, you had a concert. Um, which, um, if anyone did not get to see it, do we have a link that we could post um, for people to see the whole broadcast? Well, it was very yeah. remarkable. You see people from all over the world. Um, you see a lot of Cubans, you see Africans, you see Africans in America, you see just so many people coming out um, and supporting. Um, and this was uh, essentially a fundraiser, correct? No, 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 no. It was to let people know about what the aim and objective of the project was, but it was to launch Sister Tyranny, the second phase of the project. The first phase of the project is to get Cuban medical personnel to come to the United States of America, the corona capital of the world, and to make sure that the FDA does not play any games and they let Sovereign One, the vaccination through. They let Sovereign Two, the vaccination through. They let Mambisa, the vaccination through. They let Abdallah, the vaccination through. All four of those vaccinations should be made available for people here based on how desperate and dire the situation is. That, so that was the first. And then, of course, to have their medical personnel here so that they can be working, so that they can be saving lives, just like they're doing in Italy, just like they're doing all over Latin America, just like they're doing all over the Caribbean, and just like they're doing all over Africa. And for the record, every place they are are not ideologically compatible with them. So many of the countries they're in are diametrically opposed to them ideologically and strategically. So that was the first phase of the project. The objective of the show two weeks ago was to let people know about the second phase of the project which is that if everything goes according to plan, we're engaging the African Union, we're engaging the Southern African Development Community, which is the umbrella of all the African nations. We're engaging in Southern Africa, we're engaging ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. We're gonna be engaging COMESA, which will deal with East Africa and NAPAD. These are the diplomatic bodies that all 55 African nations belong to. And we're asking them to give us memorandums of understanding, which means they give us the green light to create a resource pool, our people in the diaspora, to create a resource pool for the 4,000 Cuban medical personnel that are dispersed throughout Africa. And for the people you were conversing with earlier, that's happening right now. And they're all over Mother Africa. The last time they got international attention was five years ago, well, six years ago now, during the Ebola pandemic. And they went into um, Guinea, they went into Liberia, and they went into Sierra Leone, and they moved faster through the Ebola pandemic than they dealt with the uh, contracted mercenaries that were part of the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. So um, we feel that the time has come to create a resource pool to get them all the medical equipment they need, to get them all the technical support they need, and to potentially look at financial support. So that ultimately, and if everything goes according to plan, African Liberation Day, that's that, that project, that phase of the project will be moving along. That's what we're looking forward to. We choose the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade over the Red Cross.
We choose them over the George Bush Foundation. We choose them over Bill and Melinda Gates. We choose them over Doctors Without Borders, who half the time can't fit, make up their mind whether they want to be doctors or intelligence agents. We choose them over the United States Agency for International Development, which is nothing but the CIA in, in um, disguised, the CIA on Halloween. The FBI's International Terrorist Division on Halloween, they ain't nothing but a bunch of intelligence agents too. So understanding that these people represent the contradiction that Mother Africa has received $4 trillion in 70 years, but yet we, we mentioned what of the 25 poorest nations in the world, 22 of them are in Mother Africa. So the fact that that contradiction is undeniable, it's no need to cry a wolf. It's no need to come up with another conspiracy theory because Lord knows their conspiracy theories are just as common as horoscope predictions. So we don't need that. So what we're saying is we have a solid, legitimate alternative. And, and for everybody who wants to talk about investing in Africa, but your investment agenda is tied to the Corporate Council on Africa, your um, investment agenda is caught, tied to the US Africa Business Exchange, which is the Africa component of the Department of Commerce, it's no need to talk about you. All we can do in the spirit of organizing is offer an alternative, because that's the way we were raised. If you don't like something that you see, if you don't like something that you hear, get involved in some organized, sustainable labor and give our people an alternative. So this is an alternative to all that filth. This is an alternative to the tr the investment that's connected to the tradition of rape and the tradition of plunder and the tradition of ruthless exploitation. And all the people who know these different connections to Cuba. Cuba is a staple of Black Panther culture. So if your point of reference is Kwame Ture, if your point of reference is Asada Shakur, if your point of reference is um, Huey Newton, if your point of reference is Bobby Seale, if your point of reference is Angela Davis, who wrote the final phase of her autobiography in Cuba, which is just as important as knowing that Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the final phase of Where Do We Go From Here in Jamaica. So it's one of those things that um, people understand. And the whole world is against this blockade. And as we see, we want the political organizers in our community, we want the churches in our community to match the courage of these artists. You saw it, Tyranny. We had artists from Belize performing, artists out of Jamaica performing, artists out of Haiti performing, artists out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo performing, artists out of Ghana performing, artists out of Nigeria performing, artists out of Guinea performing, artists out of um, Sweden performing, artists out of Amsterdam performing, artists out of Oakland performing, artists out of DC performing, artists out of New York performing. And matter of fact, what this has done is it has challenged a preconceived notion that reparations is the main thing we can rally around. It might be Cuba on a Pan-African scale, but that's not not a problem because as Comandante Raul Castro told former President Obama, Cuba's due reparations for the $200 billion they've lost because of that monstrous blockade. So for CARICOM and um, Ralph Gonsalves and those others that are talking about um, reparations, but they're just tying it to um, plantation life. We thank you for the We Charge Colonialism campaign because it must be modernized. And we want and we, we don't want to talk about your atrocities 400 years ago. We want to talk about what you did four minutes ago and what you're planning to do four minutes from now. So when we look at it from that vantage point, this gives them a level of respectability. And even the fact that there were rumblings last year, you remember this that the Nobel Peace Prize was considering honoring, um, giving their award to the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade. And we got a bunch of interviews about it. And our response was, well, that's more explosive than the dynamite that Alfred Noble, who the Nobel Peace Prize is named after. It's more explosive than the dynamite he used to build. But it's the ultimate slap in the face that the country that you hate more than any country in this hemisphere is now being considered for a Nobel Peace Prize. How does that make um, the Democrats and Republicans feel? How does that make um, the Canadians feel? How does that make the Germans feel? So it's just one of those things. And at a moment in history where non-communicable diseases, as we said before, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I'm sorry, it was, uh, I was with former President um, Mugabe 
of Zimbabwe, we were accompanying him to a meeting with the World Health Organization where they sat down with all 55 African heads of state and they predicted that non-communicable diseases, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, will kill 57 million people between 2011 and 2038, which means that they've surpassed AIDS and cholera and malaria as, hum as the human being's number one killer. And since we know that the people most vulnerable to this pandemic are people with respiratory complications, respiratory challenges, why wouldn't you fight for the Cuban medical personnel to be with us right now? What Christian could tell us that this is not godly? What Muslim could tell us that this isn't godly? What revolutionary could tell us this isn't revolutionary? What civil rights organizer could tell us this isn't civil? They can't tell us that the timing is wrong. They can't tell us that the merit is wrong. They, there's nothing that anyone can say. Right. And there's nothing more empowering for an organizer than to be involved in the issue that you know everybody has to embrace. And when you look at the appeal we had, and as we um, talked about before, we did an appeal. We didn't want to go petition because we want to stay true to our roots. So just like David Walker appealed, just like the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey appealed to white America, as he said in 23, and the League of Nations, just as Du Bois appealed in 47 to the uh, United Nations and Eleanor Roosevelt, um, one of our favorite white liberals, um, did everything she could to sabotage him. And she was on the board of the NAACP at the same time showing us that liberalism and hypocrisy go hand in hand, which, we are, which we've always known. And then of course, what Brother Malcolm was planning before the FBI and CIA and NYPD had other plans. So, so we did an appeal and the fact that Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's daughter is signed on to it and Mumia Abu Jamal is signed on to it. And as a matter of fact, um, we wanna salute um, Sister Pam Africa and Johanna Fernandez who are working so hard right now to get Mumia released. And we thank you, Sister Tierney, for your powerful statement a couple of days ago. And uh, it's no need to tell um, anyone how you were introduced. That's not important. And um, Russell Maroon Schultz, who's also fighting for his life because he has COVID and cancer, he made a statement to the world that he supports the Get Out of Cuba Way campaign and he supports Cuban medics going to Africa. So we have some power. We have the National Council of Churches on our side. We have organizations of all sorts on our side. Um, we thank the media coverage that we've been getting, everything from the Washington Informer to the Final Call, all the different stations all over the place. So David, to use a biblical analogy, David Slingshot is more potent for, too potent for Goliath. We're confident we're going to keep on working. Our next show is African Liberation Day weekend. And like I said, and so for those of you who are invested in Africa and you got something going on in Kenya, you got something going on in Tanzania, you got something going on in Ethiopia. Those of you who are going to Ghana, like gamblers go to Vegas and Atlantic City. Those of you who go to Nigeria, those of you who go to Senegal, all we are saying is when you go, take some stethoscopes to the Cuban medical personnel on the ground. Take them some x-ray machines. Take them some aspirins, because there are certain places in Africa that don't have aspirins. See if we can get some ambulatory trucks for them. Let's see if we can get them some laptops. Let's see if we can get them some um, cell phones. Matter of fact, Tierney, I was with them in Zimbabwe. It's four of them to the equivalent of an HBCU dormitory. But they're there not complaining. They understand the challenges. And in Zimbabwe, you know, that's the only country in Africa under imperialist sanctions. So you have a Latin American nation sanctioned by the imperialists providing medical um, support and treatment for free to people in a nation that's compromised by imperialist sanctions. So you want to talk about pain, you want to talk about suffering, but you want to talk about resolve. That is a magnified example of it. So we're just saying that the time has come for us to really step up and do something on a practical level. We know that when many people are used to hearing these conversations, they're opinion based, they're philosophical based. And, um, you know, and um, it would be fair to call social media the tongue Olympics on any given on any given day. But this, that isn't what this is. This is a departure from that. So all we're saying is that if there are people who aren't interested, if there are people who want to do this work, because we can't do it alone and we're not doing it alone. We're not doing it alone. We're confident that every Cuba Friendship Association in Africa is going to rally behind this. 
the ones in the Caribbean have already said that let them know what the next step is. So the unity is there, the will is there. And um, there's nobody, there's nothing that's gonna be able to stop us from doing this, nothing. Um, if someone, if someone um, just watching wants to get involved, um, what would you say they should do? Should they just contact you? They can, they can contact us. My Twitter is at Junior Egbuna. My email is O-B-I-E-G-B-U-N-A. One five at gmail.com. They can go to hashtag get out of Cuba way. They can go to hashtag Cuban blockade inhumane. Um, and they can take a look at the appeal for starters. And through that, they can maintain correspondence with us. And they can just follow what we're doing. Some people, you know, this isn't the time to debate the merit of the vote. So we'll tell you what, if voting is your thing, if your life is centered around the never ending lover's quarrel between Democrats and Republicans, this is what you do. Don't worry about our perspective on that. But we got the Honorable Calvin Hawkins, the highest ranking, um, the council at large in PG County. And if you know the African community in North America, that's the most affluent county in this country. He signed on to it. And the poorest part of Alabama in the 23rd district, the Honorable Malika Sanders Fortier, a state senator, signed on to it. Um, Raz Baraka, our brother of 30 years, of three decades, the son of Amiri Baraka, the incredible poor Pan-African poet, the revolutionary poet. He, he's the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, and he promised us this summer that he was going to write a letter to the African-American Mayoral Association asking every mayor that we have to make an appeal for Cuban medical personnel to be granted access to the United States. He has not done that yet. We know that he's busy with his day to day, but Brother Raz, you made that promise. You must keep your promise. The Malcolm X Grassroots Committee in Atlanta promised us that Chokwe Lumumba, and based on the tradition of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, that they belong to the New African Fraternity, which includes the New African People's Association, which includes the Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa, which includes in Cobra, and Chokwe Lumumba Jr., would, if he saw Asada Shakur tomorrow, he wouldn't say Sister Asada, he wouldn't say Comrade Asada, he'd say Auntie. So stand with your aunt. Stand with your neck, stand with your aunt. Be a good nephew, brother. And the way that you can do that is you can make another letter right after Ras Baraka to the African American Mayoral Association and the National Conference of Black Mayors. We will utilize our mayor, Sister Tyranny. Whenever we deal with police terrorism, we skip over the mayors all the time, even though the mayors have the same relationship to the police that presidents have to militaries. They're the commanders in chief, but we keep skipping over them. We're not gonna skip over them this time, especially since we know them. So Raz Baraka, the word is coming to you. We, we are on Instagram together, but for whatever reason, you're not moving at the pace we need you to. And this is for the benefit of Newark. This is for the benefit, and all the other mayors would follow in your direction. And Raz Baraka just became an alpha. So we sent him a message the other day saying that Du Bois was a supporter of Cuba, your alpha brother. We said that Paul Robeson, your alpha brother, was a supporter of Cuba as well. So now don't, don't just honor the tradition of your father who wrote an incredible essay on Cuba called Cuba Libre. Don't just honor the tradition of your old man who took the second delegation to Cuba after Joe Louis the boxer on Christmas weekend in 1959. In 1959. Um, what's his name? Um, John Henry Clark went with Amiri Baraka. Julian Mayfield who was Brother Malcolm's choice to be the Director of International Affairs for the OAAU, he was there. Harold Cruz, who many of the social critics today are emulate. Many of them ain't nothing but a bunch of Harold Cruz wannabes. Harold Cruz was there that day. Um, so Robert Williams was there. So and for those of you who know the story of Robert Williams, he was getting refuge in Cuba when Asada Shakur was a little girl. So that's nothing new either. So all we're saying is for people, so let's just be historically responsible. Let's be historically mature. Let's be historically consistent. So Raz Baraka had no reason to promise and he has nothing to worry about. And for something like this, Joe Biden's doghouse is a small price to pay. So Raz Baraka or Chokwe Lumumba or the rest of these mayors don't have anything to worry about. Are they going to deal with what's in the best interest of our people? What represents the legitimate aspirations of our people? Or are they going to put Biden first? That would be the equivalent of 
us putting the Bush Foundation first in Africa or Bill Gates first in Africa, as opposed to choosing the Cuban way. So we're saying choose the path of the Cubans. And there's nothing associated with them that says Tuskegee experiment. There's nothing associated with them that happened with the uh, Native, our Native American sisters and brothers, what Amherst did, which that college is named after. And before we wrap this up, Sister Tierney, let me just say one thing. I want to cover it all today. Um, we uh, want you all to know, there are many of you, when we um, did this the first time, you started talking about people like Dr. Sebi. You started talking about people like Lila Africa. We'll tell you like the youth tell you. Don't go there right now. Matter of fact, no, do go there right now. You know why we want you to go there right now? Because this is what we have to say to you. Cuba is the first country in the Americas, and we don't use Biden's definition of America. We don't use Bernie Sanders' definition of America. We don't use Trump's definition of America. We use what's geographically correct, the Western Hemisphere. So based on that right there, they are the first country in the Americas to have green medicine and natural homeopathic remedies as part of their national health policy. So instead of you telling horror stories about vaccinations, saying Cuba's cool and Cuba's solid butt, and you want to get into this Jekyll and Hyde um, interpretation of vaccinations and tell all these horror stories. By the way, leave the horror stories to Stephen King and M. Night Shyamalan. You use this as an opportunity to hook up with the Cuban Green Medicine Brigade, which is also part of the Henry Reeves International Brigade. Form a partnership with them. Exchange notes with them. Let's organize a Skype conversation between the Cuban Green Medicine Brigade and you all. So you're not out here whispering behind our back, telling people why you feel this is a courageous effort and a noble effort Effort and you consider us your comrades, you still are hesitant because vaccinations are vaccinations. We don't have time for that. You use your time wisely and you use this time to talk about how you want to partner with their Green Medicine Brigade since that's more compatible with how you like to move, how you like to execute, how you like to maneuver, how you like to organize. Don't throw salt on this effort at this historical moment because there are too many tombstones and too many cemeteries that say you should be doing otherwise. So I wanted to get that out of the way. Okay. So, you know, um, so for me personally, the reason why I love Cuba is because I just feel like um, historically, like just a very selfless uh, nation, you know, even while they were just being deprived on so many um, fronts. Um, and so, you know, when I seen this comment, I did want to, you know, get your perspective on it. I appreciate um, it. I think it's really uh, an inaccurate depiction of what happened from what I know, but I'm sure mm -hmm. you can break it down even more. It said, uh, Cuba helped destroy Angola between 1975 to 2000 and Portugal doing the same. My understanding is the opposite happened. And I was actually <laughs> talking on it before you got on the uh, live stream. I was talking um, about the fact that um, they jumped into the Angola War, even whenever they were uh, mending their relationship with the United States. You know, you know, who, whoever that gentleman, but you know what, though? Younger people, Sister Tierney, you know, people are allergic to library cards, I guess. So there's no study when people say certain things. He may have read what Bayard Rustin said, the civil rights pioneer. The civil rights pioneer, Bayard Rustin, supported the CIA trained mercenaries you need to know why he said he did it. We must stop Cuba's rising presence in Southern Africa. This is the man who was the first one to call for a march in Washington in 1941. And let me tell you what that's all about. And that's the re matter of fact, I'm the external relations officer to the, the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association. You know why? Because the highest ranking Cuban diplomat to ever be deported from the United States, it took place in 2003, ironically, after we organized a trip for him to Atlanta, Georgia, the same weekend that Jimmy Carter went to Cuba. And he's an African. He's as dark as your hair. And um, what ended up happening was he recruited me into that organization. But between 1986 and 1996, 3,000 um, Zimbabwean teachers went to Cuba to the Island of Youth for training. And they're the backbone of the educational system. The first graduate, our late comrade Pasanai, is the first chairman of Zakufa. He was my chairman and I was honored to be under his leadership. He's the one who gave me the assignment as the external relations officer. Anyone who knows the history of Samora Marshall, you know when he died on October 19th, 1986, and the CIA did it. 
two Cuban doctors perished with him because those were his personal physicians on that plane. Um, the late Robert Gabriel Mugabe, the Pan-African icon, is the second recipient of the um, Jose Marti Award, Cuba's highest honor. Nelson Mandela is the third recipient. The first one is His Excellency Thomas Sankara out of Burkina Faso, but we're dealing with Southern Africa right now. Jacob Zuma, the former president of South Africa, is a recipient of that award. So on the African continent, Southern Africa is the staple of Cuban solidarity on the African continent. So it's more than likely the most enthusiastic response for what we are doing is going to come from SADC, but the idea comes from our organization, and it started in Zimbabwe. They told me, comrade, the Cuban doctors are performing miracles like Jesus walking on water. You must try to help them. When you go back to the United States, you think you can begin to discuss. And they said, even though people don't want to discuss Zimbabwe, even though people are working for Zimbabwe's demise every day, perhaps they will support Cuba's efforts in Zimbabwe because they feel more favorable about Cuba, toward Cuba than they do us because of the lack of misunderstanding. So the actual impetus and inspiration for what we are doing comes out of Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. So Southern Africa is the cradle of Cuban solidarity on the African continent. They love Nkrumah, they love Cabral, which is all on record. Che Guevara um, insisted that Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon be translated into Spanish and be made compulsory reading. But it's just something, since Southern Africa is the baby and there's no neo-colonies, maybe with the exception of Botswana, in Southern Africa, this is the reason that we feel so confident. So whatever that guy said about Angola, he is completely inaccurate. They fought for 14 years in Angola and Cuito Cunaavle, and what they did was a significant defeat for imperialism during the Cold War. And the second most significant defeat, or just as important rather, was when Zimbabwe sent 50,000 troops to Mozambique to fight off Renamo, which was created after they saw the damage and devastation that UNITA was causing in Angola. And speaking of that, and of course, this is part and parcel of getting the blockade lifted on Cuba. And that blockade turns 60 years old next year. But one thing we know about the African fighting spirit, we ain't got nothing but time. Angola was colonized in 1575 and didn't get liberated till 1975. Guinea and Zimbabwe were colonized in 1890s. Guinea gets independent in 1958. Zimbabwe doesn't get independent until 80. Um, our ancestors came to Jamestown in 1619, and the chains that that form of jewelry, which we weren't, which we didn't like, we don't like all jewelry. That jewelry came off our wrist in um, was 1863. And we were subjected to the next phase of dehumanization, but at least that was dealt with. So we're used to having our resolve tested for decades and decades and decades and decades. And since the fighting spirit of the Cuban people is connected to the fighting spirit of our ancestors there who had 300 rebellions when we were on plantations cutting sugarcane from sun up to sundown, and their Jose Marti, their I mean, their um, Nat Turner, their Gabriel Prosser, their Charles Durslands, their Ch Toussaint Louverture, their Kofi out of Guyana, as an African named Jose Aponte, who led the most famous rebellion in Cuba and had his head chopped off and put in a cage to break the spirit of our people. We're connected to that spirit. The fight still goes on. So, and then um, lastly, you know, uh, or as we come to a close, people have to remember way before the revolution, the first seven presidents of the United States wanted to annex Cuba. Cuba's supposed to be like Texas. Cuba's supposed to be like California. You're supposed to talk about Cuba like you talk about Florida, or talk about Tennessee, or talk about Georgia, or talk about Mississippi, or talk about Illinois. It's supposed to be Yankee territory, strangling under grip. But, and, uh, but they couldn't have that, so um, it was like Puerto Rico for a minute. It was like Guam for a minute. It was like the US Virgin Islands for a minute, but they have power. And one of the things that our people in this country, you can't relate to them because you ain't never had power. You've never experienced power. Um, you all, the, Your ceiling has been justice. 
And justice for you comes from what the Democrats tell you justice is, what the Republicans tell you what justice is. You've never tasted power. You've never breathed air, the air of a free and sovereign nation. So maybe some of you are envious because you feel you're deserving of power and you are deserving of power. But just because you're a little bit envious, just because you might be a little bit jealous, you can get over that. You shouldn't make it your crusade to work for regime change in Cuba. You shouldn't work for the isolation of Cuba. What type of nonsense is that? You should admire the fact they have power. And we know that you, like we said, ju and justice is a seductive appetizer. Lord, it's a seductive appetizer. It's so seductive that you forget that you're supposed to fight for power. And as Kwame Ture told you, Africans in the Democratic Party, you are the best illustration and example of visible powerlessness anywhere African people are. You can't relate to Cuba. You can't relate to Venezuela. You can't relate to Eritrea. You can't relate to these people who are masters of their own destiny. But if your fighting spirit is intact, you can fight for that and not compromise the fight for that. And part of that fight for that now is you being part of this get out of Cuba way campaign. <clears throat> you can't say you're for human rights. What's more humane than this? Saying that you want their medical personnel here right now. Yeah. Training people, treating people. And then we talk about Africa. And the last thing about Africa, when they're in Africa, not only are they treating the sick sister, they're training the future medical personnel who says, you know what? I ain't coming to France. I'm not coming to New York. I'm going to break the brain drain. I'm going to stay home. Those are the ones that they're training because Comandante Fidel Castro at Durban 20 years ago, he said, Dr. King wasn't the only one with a dream. Cuba still has a debt to pay to Africa. And what we are waiting for is to have the resources to build the second Latin American School of Medical Sciences on the African continent. But until those resources are available, they walk the streets of Angola. They walk the streets of Burkina Faso. They walk the streets of um, Namibia, walk the streets of Nigeria, walk the streets of Cote d'Ivoire, walk the streets of Liberia, treating anyone they can getting on the bus with the people, getting on the combis with the people and just doing their work because that revolution has empowered them to do that. And um, we say, when you look at every revolution, they all have their attributes. North Korea's best attribute is their fighting force. They got a 2 million people fighting for us. Sec getting under Secretary, it was the arts. It was the people's militia, whole nation armed nothing but a bunch of dancers and singers and artists, beautiful people. And Krumah, Nkrumah's thing was to create a base for the African revolution, but at the same time, industrialization, 68 factories, tire factory, rubber factory, cocoa factory, bicycle factory. Queen Elizabeth came to Ghana and said, my Lord, your roads are better than ours. So that was their focus. For Sankara, it was the people's brigades that built railroads, that built 300 schools, 350 schools, bricks by bricks. For, for Singapore under Lee Kuan Wu, it was the housing. For Gaddafi and Libya, it was the housing. It was the health care. For Eritrea, it's the education. It's the health care. It's free. The only country in Africa still doing it. In Zimbabwe, it's the land reclamation program. It's the women's empowerment. For Cuba, it's their health care. For Cuba, it's their arts. For Cuba, it's their sports. But because they've been around long enough to develop all these areas. And as we say, as Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah taught us, fighting to defend sovereign territory is more important than waging resistance when you're seeking liberation. And the reason he came to that conclusion, because any revolutionary country that's been able to maintain can tell you it's harder to maintain your independence than attain your independence. As Zimbabwe, was it harder to lay down British and Rhodesian uh, um, barbarians than it is to keep Zimbabwe independent? As the Eritreans, was it easier to fight against neo-colonialists than it is to maintain a sovereign nation? They'll tell you the same thing. So Cuba has a difficult challenge. But those of us who are roaming around here who are just trying to be historically responsible because we don't know how to do anything else, we're doing the right thing. We think we're doing the right thing. And we just want to follow the example because we're not intimidated by our history. We don't want to just quote 
the best history makers. We dare to expand. We don't just want to continue their work. We want to expand on their work. For example, not to personalize this too much, I'm 51. That means that I've lived 22 years. That means I've lived um, 12 years longer than Malcolm, 12 years longer than King, 12 years longer than Maurice Bishop. That means that the work should reflect that. I've had more time and I've had the privilege of learning from their mistakes and learning from the positive things that they've done. So that's the way we approach the work. We're not talking about leadership. We're not talking about where, and, and as you can see, this is movement building. We're not here to build a brand. When we think about brand, we think of fashion and we think of our ancestors being branded by plantation owners. So we're not on the brand. We're on movement, we're on struggle, we're on sacrifice, we're on service. Back to the basics of our resistance. Okay, one more subject. I know we're, we're coming down on time and this is not too much of a pivot because I we're think- We're watching the time. Yeah, yeah, this is one more. Um, so, cause I feel like Venezuela and uh, Cuba, you know- Oh yes. So both dare to our struggle. Yes. Um, so as a, as a young uh, sister that's trying to get into this space of helping our people, um, I was. I wondered what your perspective was. You know, a lot of us were cheering for uh, Bobby Wine, the um, person who was going against Museveni in Uganda, um, only to find out that this is someone who is right aligned with the imperialist United States, who is actively trying to enforce regime change in Venezuela. When he found mm -hmm. out that he uh, had a meeting with Juan Guaido. Um, what lessons do you think our people could have about this? Because um, I'm sure you've seen, like there's a lot of anti-government uh, demonstrations going on around the continent where people are very concerned about pushing out their current leader who, mm -hmm. these are all neo-colonial puppets, but um, in response, these opposition people come up and we kind of naturally cheer for them because you know, you see what's present. And so you kind of want to see something different. Um, uh, what lessons can we learn from having that mentality? Okay. Um, now, you know, um, since we've known each other, which has been what about four months now, we talk about this all the time, my sister. Um, who pays them? Who pays them? Who created them? So if we're talking about these demonstrations that represent the op Open Society Initiative, and George Soros, he ain't just busy in the United States now. He's busy in Africa. He's financing 350 of the 400 civil society groups in Zimbabwe called the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition. So I'm quite sure if you look at these um, uh, movements and organizations that are popping up, it's very probable that he's got his hands in them. And if he doesn't, his son Alexander does and his daughter does because they got a family racket going on over there. But in terms of, um, and then the thing is just to do um, background on these people. Juan Guiada went to George Washington University. George Washington University and Georgetown University, their international relations centers were set up by the Pentagon, just like Howard University's Africa Studies program was set up by the Pentagon. And it goes back to the whole thing of democracy. Nicolas Maduro was a bus driver. You go and tell a bus driver in D.C. or Boston or Philadelphia they can be president of their nation one day. They'll run you over with the bus. They'll consider that the ultimate insult to their intelligence. So who is Nicolas Maduro? He's African. Who is Chavez? And the thing is, you have to go back. This is the, It connects to Cuba. So right you are. Because in 1962, a disappointed John F. Kennedy because of the crushing of the Bay of Pigs invasion, you send those toy soldiers against real soldiers, what you think's gonna happen? He said, Cuba's not a threat because of their ability to maintain their revolution, the inspiration they give others. So when Allende tried to duplicate that revolution in Chile, 10 years later, they crushed him. 10 years after that, our beautiful brother Maurice Bishop did the most significant thing in the Caribbean since the Haitian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution, and in four years, they crushed him. Um, Morales became the first indigenous um, president in Bolivia and had an impeccable run. They crushed him. And they want to crush Venezuela because guess what? Venezuela is the biggest threat to the way we look at African life in the Americas. They're saying, no more, say, African Caribbean. No more say Afro-Latino. No more say Afro-German, Afro-Dutch. No more say African, Afro-American. They say, call you what you were before you came here. 
African descendants, stolen Africans. So they are leading the charge for this Afro-descendant movement, saying that 190 million Africans in the Americas should form one political party, should have one established educational curriculum, should have one economic agenda. That's what the Africa-South America summit was all about. And this is why Hugo Chavez purposely gave late President Mugabe the Bolivar Award, Venezuela's highest honor, fashioned after the Marti Award. You know Fidel is his idol. So the fact he threw his hands around Zimbabwe, that was to make a statement to African people, how strong he felt about Africa. And Muduro hasn't made a departure from that. We took Jesus Chuso, Chucho Garcia, whose whole approach to education is African epistemology. And we took him to Selma and we met with educators from all over the country. And when he told them what Venezuela's relationship was to the Afro-descendant movement, he brought him to tears. So Venezuela um, is gonna do in the field of education what Cuba has done in the field of healthcare. And this is what the imperialists are afraid of. And their message resonates with our people, whether they say it in the Caribbean, whether they say it in North America, whether they say it in Africa. And um, so this is the reason that they are a threat. And Joe Biden is just as committed to regime change as Venezuela as Donald Trump was. So for those of you who have any false, any, any false illusions, and Venezuela is under the same type of sanctioning as well. Because like we said, they're, they're using sanctions to maim and cripple and destroy. And we're the ones that can stop it. We're because of the strategic position that we're in. So it's just about being historically responsible. So when we even so when we even focus on this, when we focus on this the way we're supposed to, we're confident. And this is why um, the Venezuelans performed at our concert. And as a matter of fact, when we did that project with M1, the number one hip hop group in Venezuela is called B2Aya. They say they're Yoruba. They say they're Nigerian. They say they just are Spanish speaking Africans in Venezuela. And the poem that we have for children called the language poem, I'll say it real quickly. Africans here in the U.S. are English speaking Africans. Africans in Jamaica are English speaking Africans. Africans in Trinidad are English speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Ghana, just like Africans who live in Kenya, just like Africans who live in Zimbabwe. English speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Haiti are French speaking Africans. Africans in Martinique are French speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Guinea, just like Africans who live in Algeria, just like Africans who live in the Congo. French speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Cuba are Spanish speaking speaking Africans, Africans in Colombia are Spanish speaking Africans, Africans in Venezuela are Spanish speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Equatorial Guinea, Spanish speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Brazil are Portuguese speaking Africans, just like Africans who live in Angola, just like Africans who live in Guinea Bissau, just like Africans who live in Mozambique. Portuguese speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. We're all Africans, we're all Africans, we're all Africans. Learn to explain it, learn to defend it, learn to celebrate it. And this is what we teach children, but that's dedicated to the Venezuelans for what they have done to raise this issue of identity. So while we have a insidious, dishonest, opportunist contingent of people um, exploiting those of us who still have plantation love and are still promoting the amputated narrative of the African experience, you're, gonna, you're fighting a losing battle is all we're here to tell you because we've got our ducks lined up and we aim far with it. So you can keep on trying to spread confusion. You can keep on waving this flag. You can keep doing your best impersonation of the Statue of Liberty. As the kids say in the hood, you ain't got nothing coming. Yeah. And someone said, oh, what's the name of the African organization in Venezuela again, please? It's, it's, just, it's just an Afro-descended movement. And it's not just Venezuela. It's Nicaragua. It's Honduras. It's Africans all over this hemisphere. And it's following from the momentum of the uh, UN um, Conference Against Racism, Xenophobia, and Other Related Intolerances. And um, what happened is NAPO and PGRNA and all them, when they went to Durban, they had a reawakening. They saw all these Africans putting a different twist on reparations, a militant twist on reparations, an anti-imperialist twist on reparations. And at the same time, Zimbabwe was there to raise the issue of land. 
at a time where because of an because of um getting in bed with John Conyers and getting in bed with Randall Robinson, we reduce reparations to make um sound like a glorified public assistance check or a payoff or a bailout. But they reminded people this is about land, this is about repair, this is about redemption. That's why they are such a threat. And there's never been a nation in the Western Hemisphere that is not just approaching imperialism on the socialist plane, but have the nationalist and pan-Africanist focus as well, because our revolution has those three layers. We we understand where nationalism fits into the equation. We understand where pan-Africanism fits into the equation, and we understand where scientific socialism fits into the equation. So they they embrace every phase of that, and um, just as we are. Um, Uh oh, looks like we lost Brother Ovi. I'm not sure what happened. Um, but we were actually wrapping up right now. So I guess we will have to end the broadcast, unfortunately. I wanted him to um, you know, finish up. But thank you all for tuning in. And again, this is a Get Out of Cuba's Way campaign. Um, I will look and post his social media and everything for everyone who's watching. And hope to see you all in another video.